Yeah. All right. Well, you kick us off. Talk a little bit about where are we? Well, thanks so much for joining us. We're obviously at Big Basin State Park, uh, which is uh, California's oldest park, uh, state park, founded in 1902. About 800,000 visitors from California, the nation, and around the world visit here every year. And this was the site of a mass evacuation uh, uh, in, uh, as part of the, uh, the CZU fire complex uh, in which our uh, CAL FIRE and partners, as well as our state parks team, evacuated, uh, as I understand it, thousands of people from this park. And we're here today to share with uh, the governor and our FEMA administrator uh, the impact of this wildfire on the park, which, as we understand, is unprecedented uh, in modern history. Uh, we're standing in front of one of the historic structures that burned. Virtually all of the structures in uh, this park headquarters uh, burned. And of course, we're amidst trees, some that are well over a thousand years old, uh, that have burned as well, uh, but will likely remain resilient and, believe it or not, survive this. So I wanted to ask the governor, uh, who's obviously led the response to the wildfire and will lead its recovery from the wildfire, to share thoughts on the visit here today. Not before you introduce your new Okay. <laughs> and this is an opportunity uh, for the first time publicly to uh, introduce and invite to speak our new uh, director of the State Department of Parks and Recreation, or what we know as State Parks. Uh, Armando Quintero uh, brings a career of service and leadership in uh, parks, and specifically uh, over two decades at the National Park Service. He's also known in California as a leading environmentalist and an expert on natural resources, uh, and brings with uh, him to this job tremendous passion uh, that I know the governor shares uh, to expand access for all Californians to our parks here. So without further ado, Armando, I'd invite you up and just Thank to you. share reflections uh, here as you take this, take on this role, um, what this visit here means to you today. Thank you very much. And as you all heard, this is the first state park. And that was actually made possible through a partnership with the Save the Redwoods League. It was through their political pressure and engagement with leaders in California to create this as the first state park in California. Immediately after this park was created, there was a park bond that was unanimously passed by the voters. And it was uh, a bond that set aside $6 million for purchasing new lands to be added to this park system. And an important note in that effort was that that money could only be spent if it was matched by philanthropy and the citizenship in order to make those land purchases. And so really at the very onset, these state parks have a DNA that includes partnership with stakeholders and with nonprofits. And that was, that was almost, well, just almost 100 years ago. And now we are at a turning point having seen the devastation and the need to look at how we rebuild a park like this. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's really an opportunity to bring in all of the stakeholders, Save the Redwoods League, Semper Virens Fund, and others to work with the State Parks Agency as well as the other partners here, FEMA and other state agencies, to now take a look at the next 100 years. And together, I think we have an opportunity to actually show the world um, what the parks of the future could look like as we look at climate change, the, you know, the need to bring together um, diversity in both the populations and also diversity in how we manage these landscapes. We've, we've gotten a lot of learning. Uh, we've done a lot of learning in terms of how to manage landscapes like this. And again, this opportunity provides us yet another deep dive into how these systems work. And I do think that Historically, the world has looked to the United States and California for ideas about parks and how they are to be managed. And so we really do have an opportunity as a state, frankly, to lead the world in how we think about public lands, particularly in a moment where around the world, these landscapes have become essential landscapes. Thanks so much. Sure. Chief Porter, why don't you just give us an overview of where we are in context of the CZU fire what's happening, uh, not only in terms of the containment and the scope and scale of the CZU, how we're doing on the SCU nearby, and 
you up at the LNU yesterday and yep. maybe introduce a few of the folks behind you, uh, including Certainly. who's kind enough to have been with us the last couple of days. Certainly, Governor, and, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, also, I wanted to make sure uh, and recognize our unit chief here uh, from the CAL FIRE CZU or Santa Cruz uh, San Mateo unit, uh, Ian Larkin, a longtime resident and has worked his career here in these mountains and, and seen a lot over time, but nothing like this. And then uh, the rest of the team of, of uh, CAL FIRE's here uh, with us for questions, as well as our, our National Guard, OES, and, and uh, CHP partners. What, what, what happened here, and, and I'm speaking to you from a perspective of the state wildland fire, fire chief, as well as the state forester. I hold both of those titles. Um, I have had numerous uh, discussions and, and calls from my state forester partners from throughout the nation, just watching what's happened here in California. And most of us have spent a career uh, here uh, in our states, um, watching what's happening. And for me in particular, I've watched uh, early in, in my career in Southern California, the mountain islands or the forest islands in Southern California be decimated by beetles and then uh, wildland fires. Cuyamaca State Park had a similar event to this that actually consumed about 90% of all of the timber or trees on, on that state park in Southern California. Then into the Southern Sierras with Beetle Kill again, 10 plus years ago into uh, five or so years ago. And now we're starting to see these same kind of catastrophic wildfires. And I'm saying catastrophic from an ecological perspective. Yes, these trees are going to survive, but there are ecological changes that are going to happen from this event that we haven't seen in European history on, on, on this land and probably hasn't happened to this scale for 500 or more years. So how does that reflect where we are today? And so back to uh, your question, Governor, kind of where we are with this CZU complex today. We had a conflagration of all these fires coming together over several day period and then a, a blowout of fire going in many different directions, consuming a lot of ground. Uh, well over 80,000 acres, 85,000 acres. And uh, today we're at 72% contained. Uh, thanks to a lot of hard work that has happened uh, to make that a reality, uh, but also a change in the weather. We really got uh, blessed with, uh, with some, uh, some moisture uh, from the marine layer coming in. And then this fire, while it is immense and is a, a very complex incident, we have two of the largest fi three fires in the state still burning right now in Santa Clara, or the Santa Clara complex or SCU and the LNU complex up in Lake Napa uh, and that region. Those two fires are number one and two, and they keep, I mean, number two and three, and they keep uh, seesawing back and forth, not to mention all of the fires we have on federal lands in the north and the south. Uh, there is more acreage burning in California right now at this point in the season than we have in records over the last 50 years. Maybe longer than that, uh, still doing some research. so. That's where we are, Governor, and, and uh, we're feeling good about where we are with this fire, but it's gonna be a long time of recovery. Appreciate it. Sure. Mark, you wanna just talk a little bit about the last good day or so and introduce Pete, just to- uh, Sure. Just, uh, Pete doesn't have to speak, but uh, just- uh, Thanks, Governor. All right, Mark Gellarducci, I'm director of the Governor's Office of Emergency Services. Uh, really, the Office of Emergency Services role is really coordinating the overall state's response to these disasters, these fires, it's the response and then the recovery uh, in support of CAL FIRE, in support of state parks, in support of our local government, and uh, being able to make sure we have enough resources and, and, and whatever is necessary, not only to respond to the fires, but then as we transition and pivot to respond uh, to the recovery or engage the recovery. We've been doing that along the way with our FEMA partners, uh, uh, and we actually are um, uh, appreciative that the FEMA administrator is here from Washington, D.C., Pete Gaynor, 
uh, and the regional administrator, Bob Fenton. Uh, many of you have seen Bob and myself many times together on these events. Uh, we work very, very closely uh, aligned. And really what, what we're looking at today is we're assessing uh, what the damage is here, of course. And uh, as, as previous speakers uh, mentioned, the idea is, is to rapidly uh, clean uh, up the park, clean up our communities, uh, get, get individuals, get the park back into uh, um, a way where they can continue to move forward in their recovery effort. So this is, um, this is a little bit of a marathon, not a sprint. We're gonna work through all this. Uh, um, under the governor's direction, he had a state of emergency. We have all the uh, assets of the state uh, and now with FEMA's support, uh, the president did declare a major disaster for this area and, and with uh, evidence by uh, the administrator being here, uh, seeing firsthand and collectively we're going to work together, leveraging all the resources to be able to, to get ourselves back up on our feet. So we really appreciate them being here. Great. Governor. No, thank you. And Chris, can I torture you a little bit? Don't worry, this is not like a, this is not a real press conference, Chris, even though, I mean, I want to say respect to the press that are here, but there are only a few, uh, and it's not live, and it's really for us. And so you're here, and it would be remiss because all of us are here and owe you a great deal of gratitude for the work you're doing uh, and work you've done. But I know this is a special place for you, and you have a special, uh, and I think very heartfelt feelings about this, very emotional, and I just think it would be very impactful if you can just talk a little bit more about your connection to where we're standing quite literally and moreover about the devastation you've had experience over the last week. Thank you, Governor. Appreciate that. And I appreciate everybody coming here. Um, yeah, I, I've been coming here um, for 25 years and there was a, a moment where as a volunteer, I was able to, to work on a prescribed fire in this park 25 years ago that really cemented my commitment to, to wanting to work for state parks. Um, I've worked uh, in the natural resource side of, of management uh, for most of my career here. Um, I've spent a lot of time thinking about these trees and the effects of fire on it, um, trying, to, trying to do the best we can to, to manage uh, these forests with prescribed fire with our sister agency, CAL FIRE. We've done that for years. Um, seeing this event, uh, unprecedented, uh, the, the effects that we're seeing in this forest, um, so significant to both our cultural history here and, and our natural history. And my heart really does break. <clears throat> Not only for my, <clears throat> my staff, who have given everything to get through this, um, <clears throat> but for the people that I know, how much this means to them, the memories here, um, the generational commitment that people bring their families here year after year. I mean, I've seen people come here and literally break down when the first time they've been here. It's so incredible to them. We have people from across the nation, across the world, who have reached out to us since this event because it means something to them to see the change that's come here. Um, but I know that we will get past that, and I know that there's so much support out there, both for this park, for our state park system, and for what it means to steward public land for the public's good in perpetuity. That means so much. It's such a good idea. Um, having our new director step in on day one here today and be confident that we're going to get through this, it, it makes me feel great. Um, having the governor, the resource secretary, and everybody from CAL FIRE, from FEMA here, it, it really cements the fact that this is a very meaningful place <clears throat> to all of us. And I, I, I look forward to, to working with everyone to find our way into the future so that we have a sustainable park for the future generations. So thank you. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Chris, for everything you're doing. And thank you for putting this in perspective. And thank you all, all of you, Cal Fire behind me and folks uh, rather in front of me, Cal Fire. Uh, in particular for all the heroic work you guys are doing, all the mutual aid uh, that's ongoing in this fire. We've got over 900 fires uh, that have sparked just in the last few weeks in the state of California, close to 16,000 firefighters currently out on the lines, 15,600 or so out in the lines uh, working these fires. We've been on the phone with governors from all over the country. Uh, we now have 93 engines from uh, eight plus states and National Guard support from additional states. Uh, 
tragically, uh, we lost uh, the life of a young firefighter yesterday from Oregon. Um, Kate Brown, Governor Brown uh, from Oregon, was kind enough to, to reach out to me a week ago saying uh, we provided some support, uh, but let me know if you need more support. And we said we need more support. Uh, she not only sent uh, down a number of engines, she sent down her son uh, who was working the lines. Um, and fortunately, he was part of the strike team uh, where this incident occurred yesterday, where the accident occurred. Fortunately, her son's okay, uh, but our heart goes out to the loss of a firefighter uh, and others that were injured on that rig. And it just reinforces how dangerous uh, this work is and how heroic uh, those men and women are that are out there on the lines uh, doing the kind of work uh, that all of us, frankly, have come to um, appreciate, admire, um, and, uh, and often just expect uh, that we take times for granted uh, that has really uh, done everything we can to be here where we are today, quite literally, to save uh, this majestic forest. And I want to say that, save it, because um, I know when you see these images, you're filled with stress and pain and uh, you're, you're, you're anxious about your own future, your own connection to your community, this, this state, our nation, the world more broadly, because uh, you feel like we've lost something forever. Uh, I want folks to know, uh, you know, we come and go. <laughs> These trees see around me, some of them have been up for 13, 14, 1500 years, been alive for 14, 1500 years. Uh, they have scars that make this fire look modest in comparison, uh, and yet they're still standing. Uh, it's a testament to Mother Nature's resiliency. It's a testament to our resiliency, and it's a testament to my optimism, I hope our optimism about our fate and future. Armando talked about this is an opportunity to think anew in terms of how we can reimagine a park system. And this is the state that led the nation. This is a nation that led the world in stewardship uh, and invested uh, in generations by investing in place like this. And so our opportunity to reestablish that, to reinvigorate that mindset, that commitment, that devotion to this collective cause that transcends our time on this planet uh, is very much alive and present at this moment. And so I wanna thank the team assembled. I wanna thank everybody uh, for believing uh, in uh, the national park system, our state park system, uh, in particular this, the state's oldest park uh, and a big part of the movement that became the national parks movement all across this nation inspired, as I said, other natures around the world. Um, Pericles wasn't alive when a few of these trees uh, were born, but I recall a wonderful quote from Pericles who said to the Athenians, we do not imitate for we are a model to others. And I say that in the spirit uh, of what Tom and others were saying uh, about the spirit of leadership as it relates to stewardship. Uh, and that leadership and that commitment to stewardship, uh, to the environment, to mother nature, uh, to leading by example, um, is still not just surviving, but thriving uh, here in the state of California, despite these historic obstacles. Uh, 1.48 million acres, that's as of last night, how many acres have burned here now in the state of California. This is unprecedented uh, in modern recorded history to date. Uh, while we have 900 fires that have sparked 34 additional fires last night, um, most of them, in fact, not most, overwhelmingly, uh, those fires uh, are now part of stats, part of our past. We have a couple dozen that are still active uh, that we're still working hard uh, to mitigate. The LNU and the SCU being two of the three uh, largest uh, fires in terms of acreage uh, that have burned in the state of California. Ongoing, tough, stubborn fires, but real progress is being made uh, in that 60, 70 plus percent range in containment. Uh, and we're holding the line quite literally, not just figuratively. Uh, again, testament uh, to Tom and his team and all the incredible mutual aid we're getting. That mutual aid, and forgive me extending this, um, is profoundly important because that mutual aid extends not just to other states, but the federal government. Deb Pete here, uh, it's a big deal, guys. I have a head of FEMA here in the state of California. He was just out there uh, battling floods in Louisiana, uh, Texas, and elsewhere. Um, he's dealing with more challenge, more stress than probably any previous FEMA director in modern history as we're dealing with things that 
you know, happen every 500 years. It seemed to happen every uh, five years. Things that happen every 100 years seem to happen every damn year. Uh, and so I just want to thank Pete and his team for being out here uh, and Bob, the regional director, for their incredible steadfast support uh, of this region, this state. We simply could not do it without them. Uh, we don't even have to ask anymore. Uh, the answer seems to be yes before we even ask the question. Uh, that's how strong this partnership has been. And I just uh, would be remiss not to say that in front of them, uh, not just over a press release uh, or over uh, the media. Uh, let me just close by making one additional point, um, and that is in the spirit of Chris's comments. Uh, it's remarkable how many people, quite literally, that saw images of uh, uh, what you see behind me, reached out directly to say, what can I do to help? How can I give back? I remember being there as a kid. I remember like yesterday, I was there with my grandfather. I remember bringing my own kid out there to the amphitheater and seeing their connection wasn't intellectual, it was visceral. They were connected in a congruent way uh, to mother nature, the earth, and they became little environmentalists. I didn't have to say another word because of that experience. Uh, what can I do to contribute to the cause of rebuilding? It's been extraordinary, that sentiment, and that commitment. And so again, it's just in the spirit of optimism, uh, and I say that because it's just a demonstrable proof point, demonstrable example uh, of why we should be optimistic uh, about our capacity to recover and be resilient and use this as a teaching moment, use this as a moment uh, where the scars of previous moments uh, are uh, clearly marked in trees behind me that withstood fires over uh, a millennium, millennium ago. Uh, but a teaching moment uh, to remind people of you know, how vulnerable we are uh, and, uh, and, and what we mean in the larger uh, construct. And that is to put our, thing, our stuff in perspective, all our differences, our angst, uh, our feeling of inadequacy, or, or perhaps our feeling of significance in perspective uh, when you contextualize uh, what Mother Nature uh, has provided in all her bounty. And so uh, I thank you guys for coming out. And I, again, appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here with so many special folks, including Wade Crowfoot, our resource director, has just been doing an extraordinary job. So with that, we're happy to answer questions on this topic. And then I will let these poor folks go so you can talk about A, B, X, Y, Z, S, B, this, Y, and, you know, sort of bring us back down <laughs> to earth. Um, thank you. Uh, J.D. Morris from the San Francisco Chronicle. I have uh, a bunch of different questions from reporters around the state and some from myself. Um, but just since we're right here, um, wondering um, if you guys could just shed a little more light on kind of the, the time, possible timeline for bringing the public back in here, the timeline for reconstructing some of these buildings, um, things like that. And, and if you could also just give us a sense of how much of the old growth um, around the park is going to be. Yeah, great questions, J.D. Thank you. Chris, um, Chris, you want to help with that? Sure. Thank you. So <clears throat> from what we've seen right now and what we expect to see in the coming winter, some of the trees that are still standing right now are definitely going to come down. They're fire weakened. We've had two weeks of burning that have uh, are going to have effects. And so the idea that we could bring the public in safely in the next year is, is unlikely. I don't want to really give you guys – I don't know after that, but I would say at least a year we're going to have – we have to probably let Mother Another Nature. Year on top of that, or a year from now. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean that's as far as I could go out. But the hope would be that wind stress on these trees will let us know which trees are going to make it further than a year. Uh, what comes down, we'll be able to clean up once we get the tree hazards, you know, safely removed. We're going to have a fair bit of debris flow and runoff. We probably have a uh, a lot of hydrophobic soil that was caused by the intensity of the heat of the fire and so runoff is going to affect our drainages, it's going to affect our trail system, it's going to maybe affect the road system. So I'd say at least a year before we can assess that and, and know when we can bring the public back in safely. You were talking about um, how you know your connection to this park started 25 years ago with a, with a prescribed burn and that's a very um, hot issue, no pun intended right now. Um, you know, it, 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 this is a question for anyone who wants to answer it, I guess, but hopefully the governor too. Um, what's the future of, of, of prescribed burning um, in California? How much more of that do we need to do? Are you taking a look at um, getting more of that done? And, and what it has prevented this disruption from happening in the first place? Yeah, I, let me ask, I'll ask Chief Porter to answer that, who's quite literally made a career uh, around 
um, uh, doing, not just answering um, the issues related to that topic. But I'll just reinforce and remind you, we did 35 high profile projects, vegetation forest management projects uh, that focused on uh, not just areas of, of high concern, but equity areas of concern that actually had impact on vulnerable communities, some 200 communities uh, that were represented uh, in our assessment uh, to prioritize 35 projects, including one up here on Highway 17 uh, that we completed over the last year. We announced just a few weeks ago a new partnership with the U.S. Forest Service uh, to match our commitment over half a million acres uh, a year. Uh, so we'll do you know, doing a million acres a year in partnership with the federal government uh, to support our efforts, not only in the 3 percent of forested property or rather forested land that the state owns uh, in California, but the 50 plus percent, uh, 56 to 57 percent the federal government uh, is responsible for. For new partnerships, uh, reinvigorated commitment to vegetation management forest management, that includes prescribed burns, uh, new partnerships uh, that we've advanced, and we're moving away from the old paradigm, uh, that either or paradigm, uh, and really, I think, building an area of some collaboration and recognition uh, that uh, prescribed burns need to be part, not just of our past over 100 years ago, uh, but need to be part of our future. And with that, maybe, Tom, you can fill in the blanks with a little bit more specificity and scientific uh, know-how. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, sure, and and uh, just kind of speaking in in general on a statewide perspective, uh, we are building toward a 500,000 acre number on non-federal lands. Our federal partners are working toward a 500,000 acre. By and large, we're looking to do most of that with prescribed fire. Prescribed fire is the most ecologically appropriate and sensitive tool. It, in fact, is actually the cheapest tool when we do it appropriately, do it at the right time of year. We will be putting smoke into the atmosphere, but not like the smoke we've been seeing from these events. It's not all coming in 15 days. It'll come over a, an entire year. And that's something that we need to do annually. And um, uh, Secretary Crowfoot is here as well, but uh, we have a shared stewardship agreement just signed within the last month uh, with the Forest Service. Uh, thank you, Governor, for, for signing that and Secretary for shepherding that through. But we have, we have the, the mechanism to do this on a st statewide basis in conjunction with our federal partners in ways that we never have before. And so that partnership is there. Uh, we are committed to doing more and more of prescribed burning across the landscape in different eco uh, types uh, to ensure that we preserve California's natural plant communities and watersheds, but also uh, appropriately manage for uh, catastrophic events that we can avert in the future. Won't it take a number can, of years to build, to reach that 500 to 1 million acre goal? So like, what can we do in the next year to prevent this from happening one year from now? I might just add, I'll answer your question, but I add that these partnership ex partnerships extend to tribal communities. California tribes have been uh, introducing prescribed fire onto the landscape for thousands of years, and in many cases were legally prohibited from prescribed fire uh, when uh, European settlement arrived. And so we're actually at our agency learning from these tribal communities and their traditional practices about how to improve uh, prescribed fire practices. And then, as I think Chief Porter would tell you regarding uh, the work that we need to do in the, in the coming year and years, uh, you're right that building resilience, building forest health across millions of California acres uh, will take years to accomplish. But we will bring the urgency this coming year uh, to this effort that Governor Newsom referenced last year, and that is uh, we've identified high priority projects to protect communities uh, and make forests more resilient. And you will hear more in coming weeks about these projects that the CAL FIRE team will prioritize getting done this winter uh, in preparation for next fire season. I think, what, Tom, you've got over 500 that you've lined up, right? Yeah, we have 500 on a... Uh, yep. Yeah, just maybe just quickly. Talk. Sure. So so we, we have been building our inventory of, of projects and getting them through uh, various levels of CEQA review that are required for different types. And we have over 500 projects statewide that are on that list ready to go. 
So we are in the process of sorting those and making sure we identify priorities that, that uh, will meet uh, governor's intent of, of vulnerable community protection uh, and then other resource uh, means as well. As far as the timing for getting this done, each year we're getting more and more work done. We're getting more areas where we have prepped them and they're ready for the use of prescribed fire. And some places you just can't put prescribed fire on the ground right here today. You need to do a lot of work before you can get to that. So uh, as far as the 500,000 acre uh, treatment for the, the state and private lands, we're, we're shooting for a target of making that by the end of 2000. 23. So we're getting close. And we are about 75 to 80 percent of the way there this year to getting to that annual number. Forest Service is about the same. And their commitment of MOU is for 20 years. And one of the things that we're doing is we're not waiting around for the usual environmental process. And I say that as an environmentalist in this context, it could take literally over a decade. We actually did one of our sites up near, uh, well, Placer County up near Auburn that we had on docket for 10 to 15 years from now by the normal regulatory process. We were able to fast track and get that project done last year. What we did is I signed an, um, a declaration of emergency before the emergency took shape in order to allow us to fast track uh, the movement on these sites. And so it gives you a sense of the urgency we put in place last year and the seriousness of purpose. We're going to be advancing this and over the course of the next few years. So uh, resource constraints were a big deal. You know, we saw 96% of CAL FIRE engines deployed across the state and that obviously, you know, put a strain on the system. Are you going to do anything, you know, before next fire season to give CAL FIRE more resources so that, you know, we, we have a greater um, capacity? To well, we just did, uh, CAL FIRE just got 830 new seasonal positions. We did that just 60 days ago, uh, 800 and uh, 30 of the 858 actually have been hired. Uh, we did an emergency appropriation, $72.4 million uh, to move forward to get that seasonal workforce. I also added over $85 million to the baseline budget that was just approved um, uh, a few months prior uh, to get baseline ongoing 24 seven firefighters uh, in, in Cal Fire. Historic amount of money in the last three, four years in terms of new equipment um, and uh, new commitments along the lines of what we just expressed uh, on vegetation and forest management. So we're doing more than we've ever done uh, and uh, we'll continue to do even more still. Uh, we were tested by 130 degree temperature and tested by this heat dome over the uh, entire West Coast of the United States and something unprecedented in our state's history, 14,000 uh, lightning strikes um, and uh, and as a consequence our mutual aid system was tested uh, but we are committed to long haul and uh, I'm committed individually to continue to build despite historic well close to historic budget shortfalls we were able to still make historic investments in Cal Fire as a priority of this administration to keep people safe. We are and we have been, so it has been a historic year in many, uh, many ways, whether it's uh, wildfires in California, uh, hurricanes, we're uh, going down the alphabet in a rapid uh, pace, or so COVID-19, uh, it continues uh, to, uh, to occur. occur. Uh, we are fully funded uh, by Congress and the administration uh, in the Disaster Relief Fund. Uh, right now, $60 billion uh, that we can use towards uh, COVID response, uh, lost wages uh, program that the administration instituted, uh, and obviously uh, disasters that have happened and any future disasters that may happen. So uh, I'm fully confident that uh, we have all the resources uh, uh, that we need. Uh, and just not, this is just not about FEMA. This is really about uh, great partners. So uh, response and recovery works best when it's uh, locally executed, state managed, and federally supported. Uh, and we're here today to support the state of California uh, in this disaster and give them uh, all the support they need uh, and we'll stand by the governor and his staff uh, until that uh, until the disaster is behind us. The president has made 
made some comments about maybe withholding aid. Um, is that something that could actually happen for California firefighters? Well, I, I, I'm not sure about that, but the president just approved a major disaster for California. So that's his commitment to uh, California and every other disaster uh, around the country. Yep. No, no, I just let me extend appreciation to the president for uh, signing that disaster declaration as quickly as he did, and for all what we refer to as FMAGs uh, that have been done, Bob and Pete and his team have done a remarkable job. So, you know, um, all of that to me is tangential. The substance is what really matters. The partnership is real. Uh, and by the way, just so you know, you may have heard Pete reference lost wages. Uh, Pete's now responsible for those unemployment checks, uh, FEMA. So he is also responsible for the $300 supplemental checks that we're going to be getting out uh, in the next week or so. So thank you, Pete and FEMA, for that um, as well. I do think, uh, you know, we wanted to talk about some bunch of questions about non-fire related things. We don't, I don't know that we did, but if you really want to. Uh, <laughs> All right, we, you guys can, you're all excused. All right, this is like, okay. Yeah, get the hell out of here. If I were you, just leave me with my trees. The burnt out trees. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Uh, so the, the question last night was a uh, different kind of disaster, I guess. Um, what, uh, you know, are, are, are you looking at a, a possible special session on any of the topics that they were not no. able to address on time? No. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't see that's necessary. If, if we find it's necessary, specific issue is necessary. I'll consider it. But right now, uh, we are looking forward to uh, working through hundreds and hundreds of bills, and I'll be making decision on where we stand on many of those bills. We've been part of the process of, uh, of uh, amending number of bills and other bills uh, were amended last minute. We'll take a close look and make determination of where we stand on many of these. Last night, close to midnight, I did sign one of those bills on evictions. Uh, it's incredibly important to get it done by midnight. Uh, so that we can impact and mitigate the prospect of millions of Californians being vulnerable to eviction notices this morning. Would you consider a special session, though, for, you know, a prison reform or, sorry, police reform or, um, you know, with, with the, if the federal um, unemployment benefits are running out and families around the state are approaching financial disaster? Um, I always consider a special session as needed. So, I mean, that's a... It's, uh, it's always as an as needed. It's a very easy, simple process to do. Uh, so we'll consider that as needed. $300 going out, uh, we're just setting that system up. We thank FEMA for their support. And those dollars be going out around the 10th of this month. Uh, $300 supplementals, billions and billions of dollars will be distributed over the next few weeks with the support of the federal government on the unemployment insurance side. A number of police reform bills did get through. Uh, I've landed on my desk. We'll take a close look at those. Uh, we worked on a number of those. Um, and uh, a lot of bills uh, didn't make it through um, across the spectrum of issues. Uh, and we'll adjudicate those and work through uh, where we stand on those and work with the legislative leaders to uh, dust things off. The legislative session may be over. We're just starting. <laughs> I'm, I'm not taking a break. I'm, I'm not taking a minute off. Uh, we're still working. Uh, all the issues, all the efforts that need to be advanced to keep people protected in the state, educated in the state, healthy in the state, continue. And I'm already working on next year's budget. Um, we're working with agency directors, department heads. Um, and uh, over the next few weeks, we'll be making very substantive decisions about where we are on our budget next year and hoping uh, the federal government gets a new CARES Act uh, and are uh, um, done so that will substantially aid our efforts in that space. Um, I believe the inmate firefighter yeah. bill passed. Um, are you, thank you. Um, uh, have you made a decision about that? Are you going to sign yeah, it? Yeah, we're taking it. Look, I've been working on that issue since I was lieutenant governor. I've uh, been very active in that space active on prison reform, active working with our partners at CAL FIRE, the union, uh, and others. Um, I'll take a look at the details of all these pieces of legislation, but that's an area, long been an area of interest to me and, uh, and purpose and, uh, and something that uh, uh, I look forward to, uh, uh, to reviewing the bill itself. We have a lot more work to do in that space, regardless of that bill, and I'm committed to that process as well. What about housing? Um, you know, that I don't think the legislature was able to do nearly as much on that front as they wanted to. And last I saw um, one of the bills on that uh, looked like it, it wasn't going to get through. Um, we still, we have this huge housing shortage, though. Yeah. So well, we passed 18 bills last year. Just because you pass a bill, you don't solve a problem. So 
this passing a bill alone is not quote unquote a solution. We got a lot of work to do in that space. It's gonna take us decades. We put an historic amount of money last year into tax credits and infrastructure grants, um, put an unprecedented amount of money in the homeless issues. Very proud of the work uh, that we did in the budget, the work that was also helped and advanced in the legislature on Project Room Key. Uh, which now we're referring to as Project Home Key as we're purchasing these assets uh, to get folks permanently off the streets, tens of thousands of people, some 22,000 people have gotten off the streets uh, since Project Room Key. All that's been happening the last few months um, and uh, we still have a lot more work to do in that space and a lot more work to do in housing. Uh, but uh, we, uh, we've been, as you know, uh, challenged uh, by this pandemic uh, that uh, has put a lot of things in perspective. I will put though this in perspective. Uh, today we're at 4.9% positivity rate, seven day period, 5.3% over a 14 day period. Some 3,712 positive uh, cases today. It's one of the lower end of the numbers we've seen some time. Uh, still encouraging signs, 24% decline in two weeks in hospitalizations, 20, uh, roughly 24, roughly the same in ICU. Uh, over the last uh, two weeks. So we're making real progress. That's gonna aid and bet our efforts to reopen our economy, uh, to recover, be more resilient moving out, also uh, help us with housing starts and our efforts on homelessness as well. Um, we have the new parks director here on this first day. Um, why did you fire his predecessor? Well, I don't look at it in negative terms. Uh, I look at it in more opportunistic terms. I, the opportunity anew to bring someone who's quality and insights demonstrable in terms of his career, not just his resume, particularly his work at partnership with UC Merced. You know, I were just talking about the opportunities to develop new partnerships, uh, regional partnerships with our UC system, uh, long overdue uh, at a different scale. Uh, his focus on equity enlivens me, should enliven you. Uh, this is the most diverse state in the world's most diverse democracy. We need to focus on equity. Equity of access to parks like this can change the director of a young person's life. Uh, that's not afforded all our diverse communities. So he's here for a reason. He's here for a purpose. And I don't know if there's a greater purpose and reason to be sworn in the day uh, that we're here today that sort of underscores, um, I think, uh, his weight of responsibility. Uh, but my, uh, my, uh, enthusiasm in terms of his capacity to deliver on that. But was there a, a, a precipitating event that led to... The, uh, the precipitating event is I was, I've been active uh, looking to get someone who's committed to the, all of the things that I just advanced. And so that's why he's here. And, uh, and uh, I have nothing but good things to say about the former director. In fact, working right now to uh, help her with uh, her next career path too. So it's just an opportunity to bring in new people. I'm, I'm, I've only been governor 20 months, less than 20 months. Uh, so I'm just getting started here. Uh, we're bringing in a team, we're gonna be hiring folks. And, uh, and, uh, and so expect, uh, expect more decisions. Uh, it's kind of exciting. Um, should the state be issuing uh, health advisories um, or he warnings about wildfire smoke in the same way that we do um, for like an active fire coming for an earthquake? Are you considering any kind of statewide uh, smoke alert system. Well, we have that, and, and but to the extent my health director is not here, um, he talked about this a couple of days ago. Uh, I'd refer back to the press conference we had, I think um, uh, either it was Monday or Friday, uh, where he talked in more specific terms uh, about some of those advisories. I'll, I'll provide you a little more contemporary information on that, uh, building on, on what he advanced uh, last week. Governor, can I just ask you, I don't know what your history is with this park, because you've been here much in, in the past, but after what you've seen here this morning, this afternoon, I mean, what is your sense of what's happened here and the feeling, we heard how emotional Chris was, of what we've seen, the devastation we've seen and, and the loss we've suffered? I, I, I think, I mean, it is emotional. And, and if, you, if this is not a gut punch, uh, then you're not fully conscious as a human being. Um, and uh, and, and, and a, another reminder uh, of how important it is to be stewards uh, and how important it is to have a sustainable mindset, not just a situational one. And what I mean by that is um, we're so struck by the moment, who's up, who's down, who's winning, who's losing, who's here, who's not. Uh, that's a situational mindset. And frankly, most of the world's problems come from that mindset. Uh, this is all about sustainability. Uh, and when we talk about sustainability here, you're talking thousands of years, not just 
uh, dozens of years, even hundreds of years. And so I think that's a healthy thing to bring that mindset in the work we're doing, uh, long-term, not short-termism. Um, and so to me, that connects with not just the head, it connects with the heart, also connects, as you say, with you know childhood memories. These are indelible. We're talking to Mark Giladucci, uh, who grew up in and around here and was just sharing the same emotional connection to this site um, and his memories. But you don't ever, you know, you never lose those memories as a child. Um, you just remember the, the architecture of the old cabins. You remember uh, the old bear signs. You remember the sounds, the smells. Uh, you uh, remember the canopies. Of course, you lose that. Uh, you lose a little bit of those memories. And those, uh, you know, memories in this respect are seared in a different construct uh, than they were as a child. Uh, but they're precious and they're magical. Um, and it is life at the end of the day is about magical moments and people that spend time places like this experience those magical moments. And so, uh, this is just a reminder of how we need to get more people to be stewards, more people to feel truly connected, uh, particularly folks that live a few miles away that don't even know this exists. And, uh, if nothing else, this will remind them, uh, how blessed we are and how precious, uh, 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 life is and how extraordinarily precious uh, a magical forest like this is as well. One more thing, um, the new four-tier color-coded system, why did it take five months for us to have that kind of, you know, easy, simple, like the, the, the Homeland Security threat level system that people could understand um, where they weren't as confused as we, as we saw them be? Um, why did it take this long to get to that kind of system? And by implementing it, are, are you admitting that some counties were allowed to reopen too quickly that uh, contributed to community. We, uh, we, uh, we made the commitment in partnership with the counties, with our federal partners, um, in recognition uh, of the importance of more clarity, not just for the counties, not just for health directors, but more importantly for the public um, and for industry leaders. We did all that in partnership in an iterative process. It's a dynamic process. Um, we haven't dealt with a pandemic like this in our past. There was no rule book. There was no playbook. There was no uh, manual that said, here's what you're doing. Uh, we learned from 50 other states. We learned from different nations. Uh, we learned from our own experiences. We bring all that to bear um, in a constant effort to uh, be you know, dynamic, to meet the moment and, and uh, be more flexible in our approach and attitude. And that's what created the energy to put together uh, the new tiered strategy and to the extent that we'll learn from this experience over the next 60, 90 days, I imagine uh, we'll try to tweak that as well, moving into January, February, March. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.